Greetings, boys and ghouls, both living and undead. It's that time again, Halloween, the time where ghostly apparitions reveal themselves and creatures of the night come out of the shadows. Be warned, I have returned with three cautionary tales sure to send a chill up the spine of any self-respecting artist. Once again, I present to you Artist Horror Stories from Hell. Happy Halloween. I'm your host for this evening. Tonight is a night of mystery and macabre, where danger lurks around every corner, just waiting for the most opportune moment to strike. I'm sure you're familiar with the feeling of something sinister that's out to get you. And if you're an artist, you might be right. As illustrated in these three tales that I'm about to present to you tonight. Three stories of artists who found themselves in considerable predicaments. Note this, all of these tales are based on true events, although the names have been changed to protect the anonymity of the victims. But while I spin these yarns of woe, I will be illustrating a sketch cover from one of my favorite movie anthologies. Created by horror masters Stephen King and George Romero. It's no mystery of my fondness for anthologies, as you can see, as I begin to tell my own stories, but without any further delay, let me recount my first narrative entitled It Came From The Inbox. We begin this tale with the story of an up-and-coming artist. Let's call her Sarah. Sarah woke up one morning after getting her coffee and she began to check her email when she found something quite interesting. This looked like a very nice opportunity for Sarah. I'll read the email as it is written. My name is Jane Monroe. I recently bought a luxurious home and I'm looking to furnish it with beautiful artworks. Kindly send me images of your recently concluded art pieces. Better yet, Send me a link to your website so I can look through and make inquiries on the pieces that catch my sight. I need this done quickly as I'm hosting a housewarming party quite soon. For your trouble, I'm willing to pay far greater than your asking price. Needless to say, Sarah is elated. There's someone who has approached Sarah, a relatively new artist who does nice work, but still, she hasn't quite reached that level of success, so the fact that somebody is willing to pay for her artwork and it seems like price is no option, well, this is, could be quite the, let's say, opportunity for Sarah. So she responds to the email with a link to her website and <laughs> Jane quote unquote, responds relatively quickly, stating the three pieces that she's interested in, which coincidentally just so happen to be the first three images on Sarah's website. She says that these pictures would look beautiful in her home and is prepared to pay $9,000 for them. Sarah's taken aback. She's never made this kind of deal with her artwork. This could really put her in the big time. So it's no wonder that Sarah anxiously waits by her mailbox for the check for $9,000 to come. To her surprise, the check does come. 
again rather quickly, but the amount is for $12,000. A little bit more than the $9,000 promised. Sarah wonders what the difference is, but she's a little behind on her payment, so she deposits the money. Not long after that, she gets another response from <laughs> Jane, who says, I apologize, but I have all of this artwork from various artists that I'm purchasing, and I made a bit of mistake and sent you an overpayment for the three paintings. I'm actually only interested in two of those paintings. I apologize for the mistake, but I am willing to pay uh, what we originally agreed on, $9,000, for just two paintings and not three. I hope that's sufficient. Sarah thinks to herself, that's still a pretty good deal. I'm getting more money for just two paintings when I thought I would have to part with three. And so she quickly follows the instructions to send the difference in form of a money order back to the address that Jane provided. Unfortunately, and I'm sure some of you can see where this is going, the check for $12,000 bounces and poor Sarah has already sent the money order for the three thousand dollars to the person that we come to know as Jane. So now Sarah is out three thousand dollars and possibly the artwork and shipping if she shipped it. The thief never had any interest in the artwork and the fake addresses the pieces were sent to means the art could wind up anywhere, lost forever, never to be seen again. Perhaps you've seen this scam and hopefully none of you have fallen for it, but it's a common one and it comes in different variations. There are some warning signs to look for. Be aware of generic greetings, people that don't do enough research to address you by name or seem to be unfamiliar with the kind of art you do or even what they want to buy. Also, be cognizant of strange URLs, poor grammar or odd phrasings. Also note that the email is usually foreign because many of these scams require long shipping times for things to go back and forth. There's also usually an urgency. They want the artwork very fast and it usually seems like price is no option for them, which any artist knows that that's typically not the case. They also usually request that all transactions are done in cashier's checks or money orders, which the ones they send are typically fraudulent. They also want to use their own shipping company or third-party shippers. All in all, if you see something like this and it looks fishy, just Google it and see if there are similar scams out there. I know for an artist who's trying to make it in the world, you want the best of this situation. You want to believe it's real, but you don't want to be taken for a ride. Poor Sarah. I guess she didn't identify the warning signs. I'm sure that's a mistake she won't make twice. Our second story of the evening involves Jane who finds himself enamored by a particularly mesmerizing figure in a tale I call The Handshake Deal. Our next story involves James, who is approached by Laidback Larry to design a packaging system for his new line of energy drinks. James's phone call with Larry provides insight into the client's character. He's a very smooth talking, charismatic, like I said, laid back character. Fun loving, easy to work with. Sounds like a really down to earth, nice guy. 
eager to get started on the project, James says, well, I'll draw up a contract then. And of course, Larry says, whoa, well, you see, I do things a little differently. I'm not like one of those stuffy corporations. I believe in a good old fashioned handshake deal. I'll tell you what, let's meet. I believe in personal relationships, but I really have to get moving on this and I'm going to be out of town for the next few days. So if you could get started right now, I'll send a down payment, but I need to get the ball rolling and I'd really like to get to know you and meet you and, and talk all about this project because I've got so much more that I want to do with my line of energy drinks and I want you to be a part of it. So because Larry seems like such a nice guy, James is like, okay, well, I'll get started then, and of course James does an incredible job on the artwork for the design of these energy drinks, and soon after that, a meeting is scheduled with Larry. They meet, and again, Larry is a very friendly, charismatic gent. He tells James how he loves all the finished artwork that was sent over to him, and it was a pleasure doing business with him, so to seal the relationship, James reached his outstretched hand and is greeted not by Larry's hand, but by a bloody hook. <laughs> <laughs> the lesson to be learned here, don't get hooked into a handshake deal. Always use a contract. And in the contract stipulate what is expected. What is the timeline? What's the compensation? What rights are being transferred? What happens if the job is cancelled? What happens if there are additional changes to the original contract, etc. Not to point any fingers, but I think James should have known better. Tonight's final story concerns an artist who finds out the hard way that competitions aren't always fair. In a story I like to call One Lucky Winner. Our final tale is that of Stephen, who finds that his favorite band, Ulterior Motives, is partnering with a rather large creative software developer to run an art contest to design a concert shirt. The grand prize is $10,000 to one lucky winner. Stephen, being a fan of Ulterior Motives, is anxious to get started and starts churning out design sketches and comes up with something really cool that he thinks the fans of Ulterior Motives and the band would go crazy for. Steven submits his artwork, of course, hoping to win and thinking he might actually have a good chance at it. It turns out his entry is quite popular throughout the fan community and the online voting process, but in the end, ultimately, doesn't win the grand prize. Steven, of course, is let down, but still being a fan of Ulterior Motives goes to their concert. And at the merch table, he sees the winning shirt and is a little let down that his wasn't the winning shirt again, but likes the design as well and is about to purchase the t-shirt. But as he reaches down for his wallet, his eyes turn to the merch table where he notices several different swag items that include his own designs on things like postcards and coasters and lanyards. Stephen doesn't understand. But he didn't win the contest, they're still using his artwork. He wasn't paid a cent. What Stephen failed to do was read the fine print when he entered the contest, stipulating that all contest submissions become the property of the band and are theirs to do with what they want. The moral to this story is always read the fine print 
You never know what you could be giving up. It could even be your very soul. <laughs> Just a word about contests. They're rarely worth your time and typically the only people that benefit from them are the ones running the contest. You see this with crowdsourcing companies like 99 Designs, where tons of artists enter logo submissions for a company that selects one lucky winner. If you're not the winner, then you're out all the time you spent and stuck with a logo design that is pretty useless for anything other than maybe a portfolio piece. Here's my advice for anyone looking to enter a contest. Read the fine print. Make sure you're not signing away any of your rights over to someone else. It's also a good idea to only enter contests where if your work isn't chosen, you still have the ability to market it yourself. As in something with your own creator-owned idea as opposed to designing a company logo or art based on an IP that someone else owns and you can't legally sell it somewhere else. It's unfortunate that because of Steven's lack of attention to detail, he unwittingly lost more than just his pride. I'm certain that as frightening as these three stories are, they may have happened to you or someone you know. Let me know in the comment section if you have a story you'd like to share. Until next time, remember, keep vigilant and be cautious of those unethical forces out to bleed you dry. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at Surfworks on social media, and now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. Do you like making comics? Then go to surfworks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.